to the Candy Colored Studio. Today is a beautiful day and it's beautiful for so many reasons, but one of those reasons is because my Instagram friend, Melissa Rocco, is here today and we met obviously on Instagram, but I was so impressed with all the wonderful things that she was doing and we connected because of art, but then you'll find out that she has all these passions and um, quests that are also really, really um, important, not just to her, but to so many of us. And um, I'm just really excited to have you, Melissa. Melissa, welcome. Oh, thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. Well, let's just jump right in. I would love to have you tell us a little background about you, your family, anything you want to share. Sure. So um, right now, I think this is probably a typical pandemic story. I'm living in Florida at my parents' house. I haven't really had a full-time job um, for a year. And before that, uh, finding steady work had been hard. So I'm just hanging out here with my parents, um, enjoying nature. I've spent a lot of time kayaking since I have a free schedule. Um, I have three sisters and we're all kind of spread out. I have a sister that lives in New York and she's about to move to Seattle. I have one sister that lives here nearby and I have another sister out in Idaho. Um, she's married and has three kids. My sister that lives here is married. And then my sister moving to Seattle, she lives with her girlfriend and they're gonna move out there together. Um, my dad was in the army when I was growing up. So we moved around probably every three years and I still have moved, even as an adult, I've moved probably even more than that sometimes. And my mom is from Norway, but she moved here when I was a kid. So um, I just have this love for Norway, I think, because I have family there and, and it's so beautiful, so. Totally. Okay, so Robles are like seriously all girls then. It's just your dad and a whole it's bunch of girls, which is so yeah. fun. What I mean, obviously you don't know any different, but what fun that must be to grow up in a household of girls and to get to travel the world together with your parents. It just sounds like a really fun adventure. Yeah, it was really fun. And um, my sister in Idaho has three girls, so there's no wow. boys. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> okay, so Robel is your dad's name and your mom, what's mm -hmm. her maiden name again? I think we talked about um, it on Instagram. Yeah, it was it's Comstrup, which uh I know yours is your Nate last name is Berg, which means mountain in Norwegian, but Comstrup was actually it's a farm, but it was I think there's a mountain named Comstrup in Sweden somewhere from I'm I i forget, but it, there's like a mountain connection. That's so somewhere. cool. I love yeah. that. Oh, that's awesome. And then you served a mission. Was it dead? No, you didn't. We no, just I just had family you, there. Your mom. Oh gosh. We talked about Norway and you love Norway, but did, did you pick up some of the language? I'm trying to remember. I did. So I could do some family history. Oh yeah. So, so, um, I think like church, I I've gone to church in Norway a few times, even though my, my family there aren't members, but I've gone every a little bit and I can understand Norwegian best at church and, uh, and listening. I'm not as good at speaking, but listening and reading, I can get by. Um, yeah, but church is where I understand the most that's going on. I think just because I've done a lot of family history and, you know, church has a lot of information and sites and glossaries and things like that for it that's amazing and are your sisters as passionate about it as you are or is this just kind of your thing i think i do it the most but my my sister in idaho also does it a lot and we kind of work on different lines um she there's a little bit of russian in our family and she's really good with languages so she's been focusing on that a little bit lately and it's it's a line that i never really paid that much attention to so um combined i guess we're getting a lot done that is so great. I love that. What fun is that, that you get to work on that, and even though you're so far away, because obviously Florida and Idaho, <laughs> you yeah. probably don't see each other as much as you would love, but. No, but yeah, it's, really it's fun. fun. We'll, we'll send each other things that we find every once in a while. It's good. That's so cool. Well, one of the things that I love about you, Melissa, is that you are multi-passionate and that you went to law school, but you're also an artist. You took off to the other side of the world and helped at refugee camps. Tell us just a little bit more about your journey. Anything you want to share about those three parts of your life? 
Yeah, so um, I really love making art and I took art classes growing up, uh, always had it as an elective in school and then got a bachelor's in art from Florida State. And my family is pretty artistic. My mom can sew and do a lot of crafts. She's really into quilting and then her mom and her sister were really artistic and my grandmother on my dad's side are. So I think it was just like part of the family. Um, but then I ended up going to law school. I wanted to go to art school and I was doing some political work in between art school and law school. And it, it just seemed like everyone that had the most interesting jobs where I was working were lawyers. So it just seemed a little more practical. So I went to law school. Um, I actually went to law school twice. I have a second law degree in international human rights law. I got it at Northwestern. I didn't really like law school the first time, but I really loved it with my human rights degree. So it, it kind of redeemed the law for me. Um, but that kind of led to volunteering in Greece. So I, I knew I never really wanted to be a real lawyer and go to court and stuff. It was more to to do this other job that I've been doing and to learn how to think differently because I'm not naturally like a logical, like, you know, I'm an artist. I, I don't think that a lot of artists switch over to law, but um, <laughs> so I went to Northwestern. I got this international human rights law degree, knew I still didn't want to be a real lawyer, was having trouble finding a job. The human rights world is really competitive to, for jobs anyway. And, um, so I just couldn't find anything. I was just doing random things. I was teaching middle school and then I was working at anthropology for a little while in the art room. And, but that it, I was living in DC. It doesn't pay a lot of money. So I just thought, oh, I'll, I'll go volunteer. It's something I wanted to do and I don't have a job that I would regret leaving. So I went off to Greece to volunteer and it was really, it was just really great. Um, it was kind of a combination of all my art skills and law because I had this broad understanding of what refugees have gone through just from my classes and my own research but we I worked in this female friendly space where we did a lot of art and craft so I was painting a lot and just using my skills and hanging out with these really incredible women um it's kind of a summary of the last 10 years of my life but, um, oh it's so amazing it's just so it's so amazing to hear that um when it comes down to it even though you're so um, skilled and prepared and understand so much about civil rights laws and stuff, and you learned about these programs, you learned about refugees, it's just not the same as going and being there. And I think that, mm -hmm. I mean, you had an experience that very few of us will be able to have. And I love how you said, I didn't have a job that I felt bad leaving. And I think that that is such a gift because I think too many of us feel like we can't um, follow our passions or follow our desires because we feel this um, dedication to a job or, you know, whatever it is that's going on in our life. And I just, I'm so impressed that you went ahead and took it because I think that is probably one of the <laughs> hardest things to go ahead and, and follow your heart when it comes to to big decisions like that. And yet it's obviously blessed you in many ways and but more importantly blessed so many women and families that you were able to connect with them and give them a respite of art and creativity amongst probably the hardest moments in their life, you know? Yeah, um, and so I kind of wanted to talk about the center that I volunteered at just so people could understand or learn like what these uh, women had gone through. Um, so I volunteered with a nonprofit called Lifting Hands International, and it was so fun. Um, a friend of mine had recommended it. She knew I was looking to volunteer. And so one thing they do is they run this community center about 100 meters from these two uh, refugee camps. And these refugee camps are a little different than other ones in Greece. There's only uh, Yazidi residents in there, and they are, the Yazidi are a ethnic and they're a religious minority. Um, many of them are concentrated in Northern Iraq, Iraq, but uh, there's a few in other places. I think the last time I checked the count is there's less than a million of them in the world. And they've been heavily persecuted over time because of their religion and, and different things. So um, this center is it's not in the islands like a lot of uh, refugee camps you hear about in the news. It's in northern Greece, and they put they send all the Yazidi there just so um, 
they can be together and they're not mixed with other camps because they still deal with a lot of persecution. But, and you might have heard about them because uh, six years ago, this past August, ISIS invaded the valleys that they lived in or the different places that they lived in and just tried to wipe these people out. They just committed genocide against them. And a lot of men were just killed right away and a lot of women were sold into sexual slavery. There's actually about 3,000 that are still missing. It could, um, give or take a few, I'm not sure the exact number, but at least that many are still missing. Um, and a woman named Nadia Murad, she's been in the news a lot. She won a Nobel Peace Prize in 2018. She was, she's a Yazidi and she was captured as a sex slave and she managed to escape. And um, most people know her because Amal Clooney is her lawyer and helps with um, her her speaking at the UN and trying to get justice for these people. So that's the background. That's like a really simplified background of what these people have been through. Um, so what the female friendly space did was just have a, like a, a nice community where these women could come and take a break from the camp and, you know, do arts and crafts. We had a crochet circle every Friday that before COVID, obviously that's when I was there, was really popular. The tent was full. Um, we also had a cinema Saturday, and usually that was when teenage girls came and they watched the movies. The, the other women usually didn't come. And we had a spa day. There's a spa day every Sunday where there's nail polish and face masks and lotion and things. It's just, it's just a really nice um, place. And it was just so fun because the other things we were doing was just art. I spent a lot of time, like the teenagers really loved pandas for some reason. Um, and so I did a lot of painting of pandas while I was there. <laughs> Um, so it's just a really nice place to let these women uh, take a break from the camp while they're waiting for their asylum claims. Yeah. So where are most of them finding asylum? Where do you see them going? A lot, Germany takes a lot of, of Yazidis. So um, I know one woman I met had some family in Finland. Um, uh, there's a few that are spread out. There's a few I know of that have gone to Holland. But I think the majority are in are in Germany. And mm -hmm. do you get to stay in contact with many of these women, or is it is it hard because obviously they don't know where they're going? So we actually had I I follow some on Instagram and and they follow me and but I I don't engage with them a lot. We just we had a lot of safe uh, safeguarding rules just to prevent. Um, Oh yeah. People coming in and out and getting too attached or, or whatever. Sure. Uh, so I follow them and every once in a while, like on the anniversary of the genocide, I sent everyone messages. Um, but it's, it is really nice to see some of them have gone to Germany since I left or, or some have gone, some left right before, sorry. And so it's kind of nice to see like these girls and these women so happy like, in their new lives. And I still have friends that are working there. So I kind of get updates on, on some of the, the ones that I felt like I was closer to. Yeah. But yeah. That's awesome. Thank you for telling us about that. That's, that's amazing. So was there, so we should probably jump in and talk about how this, this was kind of the catalyst to you launching Paths for Refugees, right? Yeah. Um, talk about how, like, was there a specific moment that you knew that you needed to create and fulfill this need? And just tell us anything you want about your nonprofit. I think so. Yeah, I made a nonprofit called Paths for Refugees, and it's officially only a few months old. Um, it, the idea kind of developed over time. So while I was there, I really wanted to find a way that I could help even after I went home because I didn't really like the idea of just going to volunteer for three months and then coming back and not doing anything. Like I'd been on the ground and I'd seen, um, you know, what had happened. And I also felt like I just really enjoyed being around these women and got to know them. And, you know, I, I just wanted help this or, you know, a way to help refugees generally or, or something um, to be part of my life when I came back. And so originally, and so in um, Lifting Hands gives out pads every month to all the women in the camp, whether they come to the activities in um, or in any of the tents. Like we teach English and stuff there too. So they give out pads to all of the women who need it 
regardless of their involvement in the community center. And so I knew how much that cost and I saw that we gave out a lot of pads every month and that's just a lot of money over time. And so my first idea was that I could just go back and fundraise to cover this one cost. Um, but then the more I thought about it I, and researched, I did a lot of reading about what it's like to have a period in a refugee camp because I hadn't even thought about this, even studying human rights and reading about the refugee conflict. It had never occurred to me even as a woman that this would even be a problem because we just go to the store we don't think about getting the products we need at all, I don't think. Um, so yeah, first I wanted to fundraise for this, but then the more I researched it, I thought, well, if this is a problem in a lot of camps, maybe I should just do something to try and, and help. And one of the things I found, or I learned while I was in Greece, was that this isn't covered as part of aid um, by like the UN or governments. And so it's usually NGOs that are picking up the cost if, or families paying for things, but they get a really small stipend every month from um, the UN or, or government agencies. Uh, and so of course, like women are gonna feed kids or, or find some, you know, if, if they can't afford pads, they're, they're not gonna buy them. They're gonna fill other needs. So the, the thought is that I can, hopefully eventually fill that need where it's not being met, but then also lift the burden or shift the cost away from NGOs to have to pay for this so they could do other things. Because for instance, Lifting Hands has a child-friendly space that they do activities. There was another space for fitness and exercise classes. There's a little computer lab and there's English classes. And we had a sewing machine that always broke. Um, it was easy to fix, but there's just like a lot of things that NGOs spend money on so if I could just lift that cost so they can shift money around, I, I thought that would be really helpful. Um, so our first project obviously is to just raise for the, the camp that I worked at. Um, yeah. yeah, so just over time, it turned into this idea. I, I actually didn't really want to start an NGO, but it just kind of turned out that way. <laughs> well, I'm just so glad you did. And I, I actually was pretty impressed um, reading through your website and just understanding all the you know the intricate details and just like you say even though you and i are women it's so easy for us to take care of something that happens frequently and yet right. it's not something that's easy for so many women and even what 50 uh i should say 70 years ago i don't know when it became more uh, readily available for women. Like even it was harder for women just to go get a steady job because right. we didn't have some of the products that we have now. So anyways, it's just, it was very eye opening to me. Um, but yeah, I, I think, I think my next question would be, let's tie it back in with the law. So obviously you told us a little bit about, you know, the law that you studied and, um, but what specifically, is there anything that came in handy while you were creating <laughs> your NGO and making sure that women get the help that they need? I think generally just this broader understanding for, for the women and what they needed, just a, a broader understanding of what is happening to women and refugees in the world and knowing where to go to research um, to research the law and know what's happening. Like, of course, there's no way I'm ever gonna understand what they've what they've gone through, what each individual has gone through. But um, actually, so in my human rights law program, I focused a lot on my research papers on war crimes and sexual violence and sexual slavery. I don't know how I ended up that way, but that's kind of where I went. And so I had written some papers on what happened to Yazidi women before I, I found this place to volunteer. Um, so it helped when I got there just to know what they'd been through. And because of, and, and they kind of brief you when they train you and they tell you about it anyway. But um, one of our safeguarding things was that we, we don't ask them about their experience. If they want to open up and talk about it and we read the room and we felt like it was okay, you know, other people were comfortable talking about it, then fine. But we weren't, we didn't ever press. So, it was nice to just to know so I could try to be more sensitive to what they've gone through. So um, I don't think, I don't think that 
that in particular really has helped with starting the nonprofit, except for just this broad understanding. And for the, the business side, like the nonprofit, like uh, mechanics, I guess, in my JD program, I took a business organizations class and that kind of helped just so I knew where to go and what to do. And I'd also had an attempt at an art gallery when I was right out of uh, undergrad. So I already had registered a business with the Department of State and stuff. So I kind of had some background, but um, I do need to say, I have two really excellent board members and one of them I met in my human rights program, but she also is from Florida. And when I reached out to her about being on the board, it was just a coincidence, but her law firm, what her practice is, is starting nonprofits and small businesses and helping them get started. So um, I didn't have to do it all myself. Callan helped me, but she had all the skills to just go ahead and get it done for me. So it also helped with connections, yeah. I would say. Um, That's amazing. Yeah. I don't know. For me, it just seems like such an undertaking and yet we absolutely what a gift it is that you have the skills, the connections to make it happen, you know, because I think a lot of us are, I think there's, we see the struggles of so many of our brothers and sisters all over the world, but it's so hard to say, okay, what, how do I help this person? How do I help these people? And, and so it's such a gift that you and your board members were able to go in there and just make it happen. You know, it's huge. So I'm just, I'm just really, really grateful, Melissa. I really am. Okay. So let's talk a little bit more. Um, I want to talk a little bit more about your art. I loved yeah. hearing about the pandas and as you described, you know, how they felt about this, the pandas, it just made sense to me to have this large, warm, soft and cozy animal in your mind. And, mm -hmm. you know, as you're trying to work through hard things, it just sounds like the perfect, <laughs> the perfect remedy. So it makes sense why they would want you to paint that. <laughs> but you and I were chatting not too long ago and we were, <laughs> we, were oh, yeah. <laughs> we were taking an online graphic design class, but shh, we won't tell anyone <laughs> <He wasn't laughs> we were chatting, but I want to hear a little bit more about your art. Like what, what it is that you love to make and what got you creating? Yeah, so, um, yeah, right now my artistic life is not that exciting. I'm taking, because I don't have a job and I was just trying to figure out what else to do with my time. And, and also that I knew this would help with, with pads, but um, I'm taking four graphic de design classes online at a community college. So it's a lot of Photoshop, Illustrator. Um, one is just the principles of graphic design. And then I'm taking a traditional art class, but it's 2D design because it, it didn't transfer from my bachelor's degree so it's just kind of a review so right now it's not that exciting but i can already see how it's been helpful because i'm learning how to draw logos and things and so when i need to make something for our instagram page i just you know i go in and use the programs i downloaded for school and make it um we're near midterms and i think i have to make a magazine cover with my face on it for my photoshop class <laughs> So yeah, not, you know, but um, I think it's a good compromise. I, I can do some art and it helps. It has me thinking about art and design, but I'm still, you know, learning um, some new skills. And then I, I guess outside of school, I'm finishing up this set of five oil paintings that are pet portraits. For me. Not like the fine art that I would like to be creating, but it's just getting me painting. And I'm I'm doing another. Uh, it's like a surprise commission. It's a wedding portrait. I think I actually sent you the photo once, but um, I can't show it or anything because it's a surprise. But I'm I'm doing a pretty complicated wedding portrait. Uh, but I, I have a few months to finish that. But um, what I really love is oil paint and my favorite painters are the abstract expressionists like uh, Jackson Pollock and Barnett Newman and Mark Rothko is my favorite so those you know color fields and just the the big paintings with the blocks of different colors and when you see them in real life it just looks like you could stick your hand into all these layers of different colors of paint like those are my favorite so I think if I had the space to paint huge paintings and maybe the time one day I would like to just do a bunch of color fields with my own take on them or maybe paint some objects in them or something and just kind of do my own study. Um, another thing I really like doing 
is which I haven't done because of the pandemic is just going to art museums with some colored pencils and and sketching and making recreations of the paintings there. Um, I've been posting a little bit of my old ones on Instagram lately, but you know, there's not a lot of access. Well, things are starting to open back up again, but I haven't been to an art museum in a long time. Have you ever tried sketching off of, like, I've noticed that some of the museums have been doing like some online shows. I saw some pretty cool exhibits during pandemic. They just literally just slowly panned. <laughs> each yeah. Talked about yeah. it. I know it's not the same, but um, I think that that is, it's at least an option while you're waiting for things mm -hmm. to so. Yeah, I think um, I'm about out of pictures to post from my sketches on Instagram, so I might have to try that. And so my, I'd like to hold the sketchbook up to the, you know, near the painting and get both in so I could do it in front of the computer screen. I could have oh, my sketch next sure. to the computer screen. That's a really good idea, actually. Yeah, there was this really good um, exhibit. It was a women's exhibit, I want to say in Chicago. I'll have to go look for the link and send it to you because it was super uh, it just was really impactful to me. Um, yeah, I'll totally send it to you. I think you'll like it. Okay. I'll, I'll find cool. that link. Um, what, what else? Let's see. So you talked about what you're creating, which, which is amazing. And I love, I love that you're so into the, the color fields and Rothko and just, you know, I, I would love to see you come up with your own series um, inspired by them. I think that would be really impactful. And for me, when I think about big swatches of color, I think about emotions. And um, mm -hmm. it seems like it's a good way to process all the things that you've seen and your hopes and your dreams for these women that you've been connected to. So I think it would be really amazing. Sorry, I'm like totally <laughs> emotional over here. Um, oh, no. But let's let's talk for a minute. But let's go back to like you you and I also talked about you going back to school again for your MFA, but you don't want to get into more debt, like what kind of advice or what are your impressions right now in the middle of pandemic? Like, what would you say to high school students that are just finishing school? Should they go into debt to attend school? Should they take workshops or internships or do online classes? Like you're doing your awesome graphic design classes, you know, anything just to jump into their careers. Like what kind of advice would you give them? And just any thoughts on the subject? Yeah, so this one I've been thinking about a lot since we talked because I think after a bachelor's degree and two law degrees and then you know like I, I don't even know if I'll finish the degree for graphic design I think I have enough art background that I just need to learn some technical skills um, you know so it's not necessary I think that I take two years to get this AA but um, if I got an MFA I think at this point it would just be for personal fulfillment because I've kind of been regretting that I, even though this law path has obviously been very helpful and I've learned a lot and things, I kind of been regretting that I just didn't go to art school. But I, I don't want to be in a big gallery. I don't want to be an art professor. So it really would just be for me. So I, I don't know that I need to do that. And I was listening, I can't remember her name, but your friend who you interviewed on one of your podcasts who started school for art and then quit, and, um, you was know, she said, maybe it was your recent one. It was about two hours long and she's moved around a lot too. Gotta be and, next degree. Yeah. Keep talking. Yeah. So I was just thinking about how, you know, she, she made a really good point that if you want to be a doctor or a lawyer or a psychiatrist or a number of things, you need to go to school. And, um, so of course I needed undergrad to get into law school. Um, and then she didn't want to be a professor or be in a gallery either. So I don't know that like an MFA or something would serve her really well. And it sounds like she's done really well on her own. And, and my sister didn't finish college, but she's a photographer in New York for a, a fashion designer. Um, so I think it really just depends on your preference. One thing I'll say is about it though is um, my bachelor's degree got me a job for a while that I wouldn't have been able to get without without a college degree. So it got me stability and it got me health insurance and things like that. And of course I couldn't have gone to law school without it. And I really enjoyed being in a creative environment and just having art students around that I could talk about or they understood like my passion for art. And then I had all these professors to help me. So um, 
I think it's just what you want. And, and also I, I went to a community college first, so I spent a lot less money on school and then transferred to Florida State. And I think that was really helpful too because there were smaller classes. Our classes are generally smaller. I, I also was studying math at the time, which is a whole other thing, but my math classes were really small. I had a lot of access to my calculus professors and things like that at this community college. Um, and so I don't think there's anything wrong with going to a community college and just saving a ton of money yeah. and, and then transferring. Um, I really appreciated it. And I think if my community college had been a four year school, I would have just stayed there. I wouldn't have gone to Florida State. Um, it, Florida State was really good, but I was, was very happy where I was. Um, and so I think for me, maybe getting an MFA, maybe in the future I will, but I, I think there's options like hiring a private tutor or doing workshops or, or YouTube or, I mean, I watched a lot of YouTube videos on oil painting when I first got down here and didn't have a lot to do. Um, so yeah, I guess it's just what you want and if you are ready to saddle that much debt. I also, I, it took me 10 years to graduate from my bachelor's degree because I didn't wanna, I didn't wanna take out loans for undergrad. And I'm so glad that I didn't because when I got into law school, I filled out a form and was in a lot of debt after 15 minutes just to cover the first year of school. So um, again, it was just keep in mind what you want to do if you think it's worth it. Because I mean, now I have, I have a lot of debt that I have to pay off. And I think the knowledge that I got was worth it, I think in the long term, but it's really frustrating sometimes when I think about how many zeros are at the end of of my total debt. Oh, for sure. And yet, I mean, you're the perfect person to give this advice because you did pay for your undergrad totally. You took your time so that you could pay for all of it. And I love that. And I love that you brought up the whole community college thing because I think that it's probably one of the greatest, um, I don't know, undervalued parts of our education system because you're mm -hmm. absolutely right to typically class sizes at least in the i took a couple community college classes after i got my bachelor's while i was waiting to go get my master's same thing like the classes were a lot smaller i had so much access to the teachers there mm -hmm. and um the friends that i made uh just we really bonded because it was such a small group and it yeah. was so much more intimate. And I know that's not for everybody, but if you are the type of person that likes to be able to, if you're a hands-on person, especially, it's nice to have a small group. It's my, it's nice to be able to go in and talk to professors when you're confused. I remember taking physics at UNLV and it was a huge class and I needed to go get some, I just needed help. And the professor, bless his heart, um, English was was not his first language and so there was already this language barrier and um I think that I didn't even like <laughs> the way that he pronounced some of the stuff in physics I for, for days I thought that alpha was arfa I was like what the heck is arfa I don't even know what this is that we're talking about it's so <laughs> bad but I had never taken any physics until until I started my master's program. And so it was so overwhelming, you know? And so I think that, I think that if you, like you were saying, think about what it is that you really want to do and, and follow that path because it's okay that you, you know, that you would just follow your heart and figure out what it is that you want to do. Um, there's just so many options. And I think that that's another problem that we have with our educational system. I think that it's really, uh, we think that we have to apply to a specific school and we have to spend, you know, four years there and everything needs to happen like clockwork or there's something wrong with us. <laughs> yeah. And that's obviously not the case. You know, you look at your journey specifically, Melissa, and I think, you know, it would have been nice for you to just go to art school, but yet yeah, look at all the things that have happened because you did the law path and that's such a gift to so many people. And I mean, I just... I don't know. I think that it is important to just be okay with our path and to realize that, um, that it's okay if it doesn't look like somebody else's. I think that it's just really, really hard because I think everything that we're taught in high school is this is what it's supposed to look like. Right. <laughs> and it doesn't happen yeah. for most of us. It, there's not a lot of people that even graduate in a field and then stick to that particular career. Right. Right. Like, um, I think when I started 
undergrad and if someone had told me I was going to law school and then going to law school twice, like I, you know, that's not even anything that was on my radar at the time, just because I didn't have, I mean, I hadn't had access to the, the jobs that I was working at, at school. I, I worked for the Florida legislature for a little while during school. And then that's what I worked at. That's where I worked in between undergrad and, and law school. And so that, I mean, law school wouldn't have even been a thought if I hadn't like, kind of fallen into this other yeah. career. Um, so yeah, I mean, things just change and I, I don't know. And even I, I keep thinking about how it took me 10 years to finish school. So I paid for it and my parents when they could help pay for it. But um, sometimes I took a year off to work. Other times I would take one class at a time while I was working. Sometimes I was able to go full time and not work. Um, and at that time, I kind of felt like you know, I was behind because uh, a lot of my friends just finished in four years or maybe five, but um, I didn't have anyone that was spending 10 years finishing undergrad, but, um, you know, there, there was no debt. I think uh, I learned to work hard while I was doing it, so it was fine. Um, and I think that helped, you know, I went to law school at 31, so I think that also helped when I was around 23 year old. I'd already learned that you don't need to do the exact same thing that everyone else does. Yeah. Well, it's good. It's turned out pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Um, well, let's talk about too, just about how things are changing. What, um, what advice would you give to artists? Um, and, and what are some suggestions that you would give specifically to creative people to support them? You know, I don't, I don't know because I have not been successful at making like art my career, even though I've tried. I tried an art gallery and I, it was during the recession, which probably was stupid, but it lasted a few, maybe four or five months and we kind of scrapped it. Um, I think what's helped me the most is I made an art Instagram and I mean, I've gotten, I haven't made a ton of money, but I've gotten a lot of like pet portrait commissions and a few things and I, I actually sold like a lot of mini paintings for people before I went to Greece to raise money. So I think if you just, what's worked for me, even though it hasn't, you know, provided a stable income or anything is just getting your art out there. So people see it. And I, I think maybe consistency, I'm pretty sure if I was working on art every day and being more consistent, I could probably, you know, do better with that. Um, I was also thinking though, one thing that is really helpful to support arts, art and artists in general, this is kind of, this experience has happened with uh, Pads for Refugees this week, but I think it can be applied generally is just sharing posts on your Instagram. Like if you can't afford to buy art or to donate to a cause, just sharing and liking and saving posts has been really helpful. And this week, um, my friend Lori, who I've known for 19 years, she posted on her Instagram and I didn't ask her to one day she just posted on Instagram. Hey, my friend started this nonprofit. This is what it does. Um, there was a fire in a different refugee camp a couple weeks ago that 13,000 people just were out of a place to live. And so I'd been telling her about it and she kind of just, I guess she just felt really inspired to help. So she posted a few things on this past Thursday and in, five hours I'd raised she'd raised five hundred dollars for me and she posted a couple other things and this morning when I woke up she sent me a Venmo that someone had sent her and she has raised nine hundred and ninety three dollars since Wednesday just because she shared one post and I think this is a really extreme example because it's almost a thousand dollars in less than a week but every single time I've posted something online I've gotten at least a fifteen dollar donation which is huge right now when when people don't have a lot and there's a lot of instability so um I would, I would say you could do that for anything. If you can get your friends to share your, if you're an artist and you can get your friends to just share your posts so it gets out there more or whatever it is you're trying to do, I think that is probably like just so helpful in a time when we don't really know how much money we have or what's going on or anything. And I've seen other artists post similar things, you know, yeah. online too. That's amazing. Oh, I love that because it's true. I think that one of the things that's been 
I don't know, I hate to say, you know, an upside to the pandemic is that it is a worldwide problem. And it's something that we understand universally. And it's really, it's been hard pretty much on everybody. I'm sure there's a few Mm -hmm. people that it has not been difficult, but it's been significantly difficult for most of us. And yet, as you think about what is it that's hard, you realize that there are such greater hardships out there than what we're facing. And so I think that just like you're saying, while we might feel unstable right now financially, and we don't know where this is going. We don't know what's going to be happening with us, with our jobs, with our families. We know that people have it harder. And yet if we can just donate a small amount of money to make their life and their, um, their week better. I mean, it's just, it's amazing how hard times actually inspire us to be so much more aware of others right and so in a way like it's so it's so powerful to hear about your friend and what she was able to do this last week and yet it also just speaks to the goodness of humanity and the fact that we do want to make positive changes and we want to help each other so i think that that's that's beautiful thank you for sharing that that's like really really great yeah go ahead um, and I think just tying it back to art, I mean, I don't, I don't have a full-time job right now, but I've, um, I've bought like 13 or $14 earrings from a polymer clay artist that I found online. You know, I think maybe having just, you know, many paintings, which I know you have and a lot of other artists do that when there's it, I'm more inclined to buy something small right now since that's, I don't have a lot. And so I think maybe having those options, that's how I raised a lot of money for Greece was just, painting like two square inch painting or a two by two inch paintings and selling them for 15 or $20. Um, but I think a lot of artists have figured that out already. I don't really think that's a big secret, but. Well, but I think that it's worth mentioning again, because I think a lot of times you think, oh, it's already been done. And so I should come up with a whole different thing, but sometimes it's important not to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> right. Yeah. Okay, how the wheel is rolling and jump in there and sure, find a way to make it your own and find a way to make it work for you and, and the people in your life. But at the same time, like, yeah, I think it's totally invaluable just to remind everyone that those little things absolutely add up. Every time you post about something or you share somebody's um, project they're working on or a special cause that they're working on, it really does add up. And so I think that, um, yeah, I'm just so glad that you shared those. Those are great. Really great. (laughs) Um, Okay, so I feel like as women, there seem to be so many things that are important and so many things that we're worried about. And yet when it comes down to it, there's really only 24 hours in each of our days. And we have to make intentional choices. And sometimes we have to give things up. So what are some of the things that you as a daughter, a sister, a friend, all those things that are important in your life? um, and, And also I would say, I don't know, just an owner of a nonprofit and just, you know, a volunteer, what are some things that you've had to give up in your life to follow these passions? Yeah. So I, when I, when I got this question, I was thinking, uh, the first thing that came to mind was I've given up a lot of stability, I think personally. So I, I had a really good job in Washington, DC. Um, I was working at the Capitol and I was just really unhappy there and, and kind of, I mean, it's, it was a good job, but um, my interests, I guess, were veering more toward human rights. And it was part of my portfolio. My issue portfolio was foreign affairs and human rights. And so I, I applied to Northwestern and, and I left. Um, and it was planned, so I saved a lot of money and whatever. But, you know, I, I left, an, again, I left a job to go do this and since then i haven't really had a steady job i've moved i moved from chicago to new york to dc i went back to new york i moved my stuff what was left of the stuff that i i sold a lot of things um moved that to florida and then went off to greece and and now i'm back so um in order to leave chicago after school i had to sell almost everything i owned i just didn't have a lot of money left so now most of the stuff i own fits in one closet at my parents house um So it's just been really unstable. Of course, people have been through worse, but, um, you know, I I have a, my parents obviously have a guest bed, but like when I move out, I don't even own a bed. I have to get a bed again, which is fine. I'll be able to get a bed, but um, that hasn't always been really easy. So I feel like that was something that I sacrificed a lot to, to just like pursue this human rights 
um, kind of passion, I guess. And then another thing, and I didn't really think about it until last night, but I've actually sacrificed art a lot. Like I really love making art and, you know, I wanted to go to art school, like we've talked about, and I've done these other things. Um, and I just have not worked on art my adult life as much as I would want. I, I didn't touch art for the three years I was in law school. It's just, it was just so time consuming. There's so much reading that you have to do. Um, I wish that I had, but uh, anyway, so I didn't touch art then. And then when I was working at the Capitol for three years, it was also really busy, long hours. I, I didn't, I didn't really do any art. I went to some art museums since they're all free in DC, but I mean, I didn't pick up a paintbrush, I guess, for six years. Um, then when I got into school in Chicago, surprisingly, law school was easier than working at the Capitol. So I found even with all my studying, I had a lot of free time. So I started painting a, a little bit and then um, going to the Art Institute and doing those sketches in front of uh, paintings and things. Um, and even now, I think, has, I mean, it's, I would say it's a job, but I'm not getting paid or I'm not taking a salary because we just started and we don't have a lot of money, but it's, it's cutting into my painting time. And I mean, graphic design, I mean, it's art, but it's not like sitting here with my canvas painting the color fields that I want. Um, so yeah, I, I feel like I've actually sacrificed something that's really important to me to do these other things. And, and I think there'll be a time when I can paint as much as I want and, you know, but those are the things I think that I've given up to do these other things. But. Those are huge things. Those are huge things, Melissa. Yeah, I think, I think that you're right. There is something about stability and having a place to call home having a bed that's yours and just being able to give up that comfort. Also, it makes you really connected and uh, a lot more empathetic towards the women that you get to serve when you are volunteering. You understand a lot more what they're going through. So then when you are trying to promote pads and you're telling people, you really know what it feels like to have moved so much, not just in your childhood, but also in your adult life. And it sounds like from what we've talked about, it sounds like um, your niche within the civil rights law, it seems like you kind of have to be in certain places to work in these small jobs that are available. And so that really cuts down your options as well. And maybe the pandemic has made it easier for people to work um, you know, from home, but at the same time, it sounds like you know, sounds like you have limited choices when it comes to jumping back into, you know, a typical workspace within that realm. So I don't know, I think there's just a lot of things that you've given up and also taken such care to make priorities. And I really admire the priorities that you've taken. And um, again, I don't want to get super emotional, but at the same time, like, I just want you to know how much it has meant to me to, to just have these moments with you on Instagram and realize that, um, that even though we all have such different paths as women, we all have such great purpose and it doesn't look the same, but the things that you're doing are absolutely invaluable and I'm just so grateful and I hope that you get to uh, paint those big swatches of color a lot sooner than you think right now. I would yeah. love to see that happen. I would love to see a fundraiser for your art and um, to be able to go to pads, you know, have a portion to go to pads, a portion go to you. And um, I wish I had those connections for you. I wish, <laughs> I wish I'd gone to a fancy art school. So I had those con con connections because I think that, um, I think there's a lot of people that would really appreciate it. So if you're listening <laughs> and you're one of those people <laughs> that has connections to make this happen, that would be amazing because just like Melissa was saying earlier, all it takes is one share, one phone call, one post on Instagram. You just never know what goodness could come from these things. And it would be really nice to see you be able to pursue these passions together and um, to be able to continue to bless so much of the world, not just with your art, but also with, um, with pads for refugees. That would be amazing. <laughs> um, yeah, I, um, I really, I think I, I really would just like to be able to make this. I mean, of course I would, 
I would like one day to be able to get paid for doing this, but I think right now I'm more interested in, um, you know, I'm in a safe place where I don't have to worry about rent and I have school going on. So I'm doing like things for me. I don't need to worry about paying bills or anything, but, um, I would just like to see that this, this grows so we can just fill this need. And I, I really would like, cause it's just, it's me and two, me who I've only been on the ground there once. Um, and then my board members are two Americans too. So it's just three Americans. Like, um, we have no idea really. I mean, even though I've been there and you know, I'm at my parents and I don't own a lot of stuff. Like I wasn't fleeing war or, hardship or anything like I um I think of course it's it's helped me be empathetic but I, there's no way that I can really understand what these women and these men and these children have have gone through but so I would like to um I would really like to have some former refugees or people that really do understand like working for me or being on our board one day um just to just have this firsthand experience and um, maybe bring in some stuff, uh, knowledge that, that there's no way that I can know. And, and right now I don't know that we, I mean, we can't support an employee and, and um, we're just keeping it small for now. But I think that really would be my goal is to have people who understand this issue firsthand to be more involved in it eventually. Um, absolutely yeah uh, that's a beautiful goal and I can't think of anything better because you're absolutely right um they yeah we will not be able to truly understand what it's like to walk in their shoes but to have them be on your board and to be an employee of your nonprofit would be such a gift it would be so great um yeah so let's talk a little bit more like what are some things that our listeners can do to support pads for refugees right now do you want to go ahead and tell them anything they can yeah. talk about? Um, yeah, so uh, one obviously would be to follow us on Instagram. We have a Facebook too, um, and I have a website. It's just Pads for Refugees. The four is the number four. So Pads, the number four, refugees.org. And on the website, there's a link to our Facebook and our Twitter and our Instagram. I'm the most active on Instagram. So just following it and sharing it. Um, excuse me, I know a lot of people don't have a lot of money, but if you share it, you know, maybe someone who can afford to give $10 or $20 or, um, my dream is to wake up and there's a $1,000 donation in my inbox, but um, I don't know that that'll happen during a pandemic, but um, $15 will cover pads for one year for one woman at the, the place that I volunteered. Um, we need about 7,000 to cover that community center for a year and another women's center just reached out asking for help and we're emailing back and forth and trying to figure out what they need so I can have some fundraising goals too so I, I would like to raise about 15,000 just to to get these two projects done um, so yeah if you can give give if not um, just share or follow so maybe one day you can give and, and I think also just learning about the refugee crisis generally. And I think Utah is very good. I know you're in Utah. I think Utah is very good at welcoming refugees and, and helping out. There's a lot of organizations there um, too. So even just outside of helping me, just looking locally to see what you can do. Um, I think those are the best ways to help really. Those are, those are great. Thank you so much. And um, thank you for all that you do. Um, yeah, are there any other things that you want to share with us? Obviously, do you, you've got the website, you've got the Instagram, Facebook. Do you guys have an email list yet or no? Um, yeah, I haven't actually sent anything out yet, but if you go to the website, you can subscribe. So, and then I guess um, in October, I'm going to try, I think you're airing this on the first, right? Yeah, so in October, I'm going to post something every day because I found that the more active I am, the, the more, um, you know, opportunities for fundraising I have. So uh, I guess this will start us off. And then um, it's not all going to be about pads because it's just, you know, one small aspect of what refugees go through, what these people go through. So I'm going to post some book reviews that I've read about refugee experiences on there. And I have a few friends who are in bands that I'm trying to plan just like a live stream 
you know, little performance just to do something new and then they can kind of bring in, you know, their followers and things. So if you just follow us for October or sign up for the newsletter, um, we'll just try to be a little more active this month to see what we can do. That's awesome. Oh, thank you so much. Thanks so much for all that you've shared and for the just so many good suggestions of things that we can do. Um, just easy things, like you say, learning, looking for local opportunities, sharing, and then just, you know, support however you can. Um, every little bit helps. And like Melissa says, it all adds up. So Melissa, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for sharing your experiences, for being willing to um, just to share all of your journey because it's not only inspiring, but it's also very uh, comforting for those of us that, that feel like <laughs> our journey has been a little bit bizarre. So um, yeah, you're loved and, and thank you again. Well, and thank you for having me on here. Like, I, I love your podcast. And I think just, um, well, I think we've talked about it, but just what really drew me to you and your art and your experience was that you decided to just do your art, even though you had kids at home. And um, I think it was just hearing your experience was a good reminder to me to just keep doing what I'm doing, no matter what's going on. Like, start a nonprofit, even though I don't have a job, um, things like that. So I think in turn, you've also been really inspiring and I appreciate all your posts and your friendship. Oh, well, thank you for that. And ditto. <laughs> I've just been so grateful to get to know you. And um, this has been such a treat, not just for our listeners, but for me personally. So thank you again, Melissa. Yeah, thank you. Okay, from Melissa okay. and I, I just want to say thank you, sending so much love to each of you from the Candy Colored Studio and from Florida, and um, lots of love from Melissa and I. Bye. Goodbye. Thank you.